We have Nintendo Power 67 for December of 1994, starting the second half of Nintendo Power 7th year. And this time, the NES is back for one last hurrah. Let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Earthworm Jim. I've kind of been debating how to cover this game since Doug Tenapel has openly come out in support of Goober Gob and is also a transphobic dick. But the original Earthworm Jim is out of print, so playing this game, at least at this time, doesn't give him any money, especially if you pick up a used physical cartridge of the game, so I am kind of okay with this here. We're not until like we're talking about, you know, Neverhood or uh, the sequel to that. Anyway, the cover is official art of the character, and having just stated my displeasure and my disapproval of Ten Naples as an artist, I will also say that I like the design of Jim. He is an expressive character, and I like the idea of an otherwise barely animate worm, which only has agency through a power suit they obtain through effectively dumb luck, and with the very expressive face that comes with this. It's a good design for a 90s cartoon character. I and I like I like the design. It's just the artist is terrible. In the letters column, we get a response to the Donkey Kong Country promotional video, which I may cover next month, as far as like just do a focus episode on that, or at or after this next year of Nintendo Power has wrapped up and I get into the best of the rest. Additionally, while I normally don't talk about prizes from the various drawings, sometimes I do when they are worthy of mention, and this is one of those occasions. As this is a prize that I wouldn't mind getting, or a trip I wouldn't mind going on now, and would have definitely enjoyed as a kid. Uh, the winner of this drawing got a trip to meet paleontologist Dr. Jack Horner on a fossil dig and take part in the ex excavation. That is really cool. I, I dig it. Moving on to the first game of the issue, we have the third title in the Gargoyles Crest series, with Demon Crest for the Super Nintendo, and the first game to put Demon in the title. I wonder if the reason for the delay of incorporating that in the title of these games, um, since I believe the Japanese titles tend to reference a Reamer, Red Reamer and the Demon side of things, it was due to Nintendo's content policies relaxing with the implementation of the current rating system. We get maps of the first three areas, and some notes on searching other parts of the map for upgrades. Demon's Quest feels, control-wise, like it works a little more smoothly than the Gargoyles Quest titles. And it also starts off in a considerably more linear matter than the earlier games. Gargoyles Quest tended to lead a little bit more into the RPG side of things. You still have your platforming levels, but they stick you in that... Dragon's Quest style overworld faster um, to use that to convey elements of story. Whereas here, we're just going right into a couple big levels right off the bat. And the platforming areas, they are fun, they have great graphics, and they take the controls from the first two games and successfully moves it over to, these game, to this game. It's not without its flaws, though. There's some issues with enemy placement and enemy respawn, which makes some elements of the levels, particularly very high pla platforming sequences where you're doing a big ascent that you could theoretically miss a jump and fall all the way down to the bottom of, very frustrating. But otherwise, it plays fine. We have the conclusion of our Earthworm Gym strategy guide with instructions on how to get to the game's cheat menu before we move on with our level maps and notes through the end of the game. Earthworm Jim is an interesting platform. It's a game with a tremendous sense of visual flair and style to it, which really gives the work a emotional vibe uh, in terms of the attitude of the character and every level trying to think, actively provoke a particular reaction from the player in terms of the overall look and feel of the level. And it also places the character in the game firmly in the 90s, but not in a bad way. It's got a sense of outsider art from everything, the level environments, the character animations, and the characters themselves. 
The controls for the game are also generally solid. Under normal circumstances, I can get Jim where I want him to go with exactly the right amount of precision. Further, the game handles shooting fairly well. The game gives you an eight-way shot, like Contra, but without shooting on the run. And instead of giving you projectiles, each with their own bullet sprite that you need to aim, Jim's gun is a hit-scan weapon, meaning that if you're lined up on an enemy, you just hit and do damage. Uh, ammunition, instead of counting physical shots on screen, counts the amount of time that you can fire the gun, continuously. Now, you can move up and whip yourself at enemies as a more powerful melee attack, but that has an animation that has to carry out, both in terms of a wind-up and a swing, and also that attack, while it's available in eight directions, um, it gives you the question of, do you use your limited ammo at range for a sure hit that you have a finite amount of? Or do you increase the risk by moving in and letting loose with melee attacks that also leave you vulnerable? That said, the game still has some real problems, particularly on the level design front. The first level, for example, is actually fairly frustrating due to the bounce physics with the piles of rubber tires requiring you to um, have to try and manage the bounce physics and jumping off of the bounce to reach particular ledges and that sort of thing. Sometimes it works. Other times it really doesn't, which makes granular navigation incredibly difficult, if not impossible. The game also requires you to proceed across the chain over spike pits, but these spike pits also have enemies inside who you can't readily attack, but who can easily attack you, aggravated by the fact that most games they have spike pits have no enemies in them either. So, having an enemy in the location often is shorthand for that this area is navigable by the player when it is in fact not. So, it's a definite example of a case where you can have the best thought out character design, the most fluid animations, and incredibly well thought out controls and game mechanics, only to get screwed over on the level design front. Remember Arrow the Acrobat? I bet you didn't know that game had a spin-off game from it, aside from the, the two Arrow titles. Well, it did, with Zero the Kamikaze Squirrel, which, having said that name out loud, feels kind of like it's a kind of racist title. We get info on the uh, special abilities of the title character, along with maps and notes for the first few levels. Zero the Kamikaze Squirrel has style and spades, but doesn't quite in communicate the intricacies of its controls very well. For example, there isn't much in the game itself to communicate that you can do a swoop jump by pressing down and jump while you're in the air. And indeed, there are some areas in earlier levels that have items placed in the arc of your swoop jump to show that, hey, it is possible to move in this angle, but it doesn't communicate how you do it. Unless you have the manual, I guess, but if you bought this game used or rented it, you might not necessarily have the manual. And, and indeed, likely, if you are picking up this game, either from eBay or the Mom and Pop Game Store or Flea Market or Gaming Convention or something, you're not going to have that manual. Even if you bought it from, like, a reseller, the reseller probably is going to charge you another five bucks to get the manual separate. And documentation of the game on Game Facts isn't particularly good either. I mean, my first thing I do when I'm doing a playthrough of a game for the show is to see if I can find a fact with a good write-up of the controls. And those are lacking for this game. Now, moving on, we've come to the end of the video game adaptations of the original Star Wars trilogy, at least as far as the uh, Super Nintendo is concerned, with Super Return of the Jedi. There are notes on the playable characters, Luke, Leia, Han, Chewbacca, and Wicket, along with notes on the first few levels. Super Return of the Jedi is, like the other games in the Super Star Wars series, an incredibly punishing and unforgiving game, and it's not the tough-but-fair kind of punishing from the, that the Soul series does. Games like it do. It's a game where getting a speed power-up is not an asset, it's a penalty, because you always need to be moving cautiously and deliberately, and going fast will take you out of control and cause you to go flying to your death. 
as opposed to having a speed power-up affecting movement to an extent where you, you have some granularity in terms of how you deploy it. It's a game that is kind of aggressively mean-spirited and hateful in a way that other Massacore platformers like the Meat Boy series or games like the Souls Alikes aren't. It punishes you for not reading the game's mind and then designs local environments that are just a little too complicated, throw a little too much stuff with you at you at once, and makes it that it's a bit too much to manage. Next up is Uniracers, a 2D platforming racing game that's got a very limited release due to the concept of racing 3D pre-rendered expressive unicycles being dangerously close to the concept of a Pixar short. Anywho, we get notes on the platformer racers game mechanics and maps of some of the early tracks. Uniracers is an interesting concept for a racing game, moving the concept of a racing game itself from a behind-the-back semi-3D perspective to a side-scrolling strictly 2D perspective. However, a lot of the strategy that goes into racing games is somewhat lost from the mix here, as all the races are strictly run on one-on-one. -on -one. There are some matches in each cup that are trick events, which are okay, but nothing I'd really write home about, particularly since I'm not really able to figure out what they're pushing for. We have an article covering the releases of two Mickey Mouse games without getting into full-on guides. There's Mickey Mania, and there's the Great Circus Mystery, featuring Mickey and Minnie. The latter game supports co-op, with one player controlling Mickey and the other controlling Minnie, and the player is getting to pick who they control, instead of the second player just getting Minnie by default, which is a nice touch. These games are covered literally in parallel, with Mickey Mania on the bottom of the page and the Great Circus Mystery on top. And then, just to clutter things up further, we have a sidebar covering how the animations were done for Mickey Mania. The Great Circus Mystery is on par with Mickey's Magical Quest. It's it's fun, and it's a little more difficult than I expected, but it's not bad. You have the right balance of difficulty to give the game some longevity, but not necessarily replay value, aside from playing through the game again with whatever character you didn't play through with the first time, though there's not much of a change in story. That said, while I was not able to play the game in co-op for this review, I appreciate that the option is there. And it's not with the, again, second player playing a character, being forced into playing a female character, playing Minnie, uh, or, for that matter, having the second character's role in the game be diminished. So that's a nice touch. Now, on the other hand, Mickey Mania is a gorgeous love letter to the long history of Mickey Mouse cartoons. On the other hand, well, some of the level design is a little overambitious, and it becomes somewhat confusing early on what enemies you can safely bounce off of, and what ones you can't, and what parts of level's environments are platforms, and what ones aren't. A few jumps as well involve the player basically moving outside the camera's view, and the game, unfortunately, does not use the shoulder buttons to allow you to look ahead or back to track the movement of enemies, platforms, and other environmental objects. Which, considering that also the shoulder buttons aren't used, indeed, basically, control-wise, this could be a two-button game, it's rather frustrating on that front. It underutilizes what the controller has to offer. And while, yes, this game is also getting ported to Genesis as well, with it effectively being a two-button game on that console, the third button could be hold in place and scroll the camera back and forth. Still, I like the game, but it's just a title that takes a lot more time and patience to get used to than I feel works. Next up is Tin Star, a sort of sci-fi western action platformer game thing designed around the Super Scope. To Tin Star's credit, it's got a limited continues, the ability to save your game, a pr pretty good sense of humor, and if you're playing using a mouse or a controller, you have the ability to set the sensitivity. Other than that, it's a little rough. As example, the second stage, one of the enemies is a big guy dragging a person begging for help. If you shoot them right away, 
then the hostage is killed, and even though you'd have a clear shot on the guy and can take him out no problem, which is going to cost you health. Only when the victim is lifted up to be pummeled are you able to safely shoot the brute without injuring the hostage. It's one of many weird design decisions for the game's hitboxes. I mean, the game is otherwise fine, and unlike some other Super Scope games, if you don't have a Super Scope and a CRT TV, it is 100% playable in a way that something like Lethal Enforcers, for example, isn't, but it's still pretty rough. In the class one information column, we get a 20 credit code, assume I'm pronouncing those with K's, for Mortal Kombat 2. We wrap up the conclusion of the guide for Final Fantasy 3 this issue, covering the world of Ruin, up into the return to the floating continent and, continent and the final boss fight with Kefka. No, it doesn't actually cover that fight, just stops right before it. So, I have played the hell of Final Fantasy III in various forms, from when I discovered emulators in middle school, to throughout high school, into college with playing the PS1 port, to playing the Game Boy Advance port, to having owned the PC version and intending to mod it to get it closer to the original graphics and fonts, all of that stuff. Final Fantasy III is, frankly, one of the best JRPGs on the Super Nintendo. The pacing of the game's story is fantastic. Each character has basically a unique game mechanic attached to them that takes them a step beyond the stake mechanics of the characters from Final Fantasy II, from Sabin being able to launch special attacks using Street Fighter II-style controller motions, to Edgar's use of tools, which provide a wide array of special attacks, from ones that attack everybody to more focused stuff, and further, the writing of this title has stepped up dramatically from Final Fantasy II, and for that matter, Final Fantasy V, I haven't played that with translation patches back in the day, with each character having a very strong arc, all of whom are intertwined, and all of whom are valuable party members. Further, unlike Final Fantasy II, the game gives the player the ability to control their party lineup on multiple occasions, so that their party configuration reflects their preferred playstyle. And this is without even getting into the Esper system, and allows you to diversify your party further by tr giving more characters an opportunity to learn spells, in turn making it a dry run for Materia in Final Fantasy VII, and the various other versions of this since then, Guardian Forces, in Final Fantasy VIII and how the skills related to that work, or in Final Fantasy IX with learning skills from weapons, all of that. This is basically setting the course for where the Final Fantasy series would go on the PlayStation 1 in a dramatic, clear form. The point like, when Final Fantasy II come, or VII comes out, and you look at the systems for that, it's, it immediately becomes, hot from hindsight clear, as this is the direction they want the system, the game to go. In Counselor's Corner, we have questions for Illusion of Gaia, Brain Lord, and Blackthorn. We have now what is probably the last hurrah for the NES and Nintendo Power Magazine with Wario's Woods, a falling object puzzle game. Warriors Woods is an interesting puzzle game that you have to clear groups of enemies by putting them in, well, groups of two or more, and then placing a bomb in a vertical, horizontal, or diagonal line to clear that line. Unfortunately, the bit that causes the game to stumble is the fact that rather than controlling a cursor, like, say, for example, Columns in Genesis, which also does the groups of three or more in vertical, horizontal, or diagonal thing, you're controlling Toad. There are limitations to Toad's movement and how it animates and that sort of thing that affects placement in a manner that makes it clumsy and awkward to play. And clumsy and awkward is not something you want in a puzzle game, especially when you are getting into high-level play. This article also has a prom promotional bit about the Virtual Boy. We get the name of the system, that has a red-black monochrome display, that has a 32-bit processor, but otherwise... The article just focuses on the concept of gaming with a 3D display without getting into how that works on the Virtual Boy, or rather how it doesn't work. 
Moving on to the Game Boy, we have the Game Boy version of Samurai Showdown, which appears to have a more dramatic overhaul to its visuals and controls compared to the console version, and also as opposed to the Game Boy versions of Mortal Kombat, which attempted, both graphically and control-wise, to replicate the console version. So, I'm going to give this game more of a look, as opposed to what I, to skipping over the Game Boy Mortal Kombat games, because I'm familiar enough with those that I know they don't work. Samurai Showdown on the Game Boy should probably be called Samurai Showdown SD, as the characters are all redesigned with super deformed sprites, along with the cutscenes being redone to fit the theme. It works by making the game both graphically and tonally fit the concept of being played on the small screen of the Game Boy. This is further assisted by having the referee of the game's matches occasionally tossing items into the arena to either provide healing for the combatants, like with rice balls or dumplings, or deal additional damage, like with bombs. It really shows the ultimate problem of the, with the portable versions of Mortal Kombat. To pretty much all platforms, like Game Boy and Game Gear versions, they are so afraid of being perceived as kitty that they rather the game as be bad instead of being viewed as for being for babies. On the other hand, Samurai Showdown is a Japanese game, um, and there is a level of acceptance of the cute in Japanese culture that doesn't necessarily come up the same way in American games and the American video games scene, which leans towards the hyper masculine, where it's okay to make these versions of the characters cute, which works and allows this version of the game to not suck. Coming up to the end of this episode's coverage, we have Wario Blast, a Game Boy version of Bomberman with Wario as a featured guest character. Wario Blast, on the single player side, is not a replication of the sort of action puzzler gameplay that we saw with the console Bomberman games. Instead, it's a best of three Bomberman matches done versus bots. That's fine, but if I'm going to play Bomberman single player, that's not what I'm looking for. And like, The appeal of Bomberman isn't one-on-one -on -one matches, it's four-on-four -four or bigger matches. The last game of the issue, but one I'm not going to be reviewing for obvious reasons that should become clear, is Casino Fun Pack, which is literally a collection of casino games like the ones which around this time you could buy from Office Depot or anywhere similar or buy in small LCD little game packs at a Target or Kmart or what have you for like, you know, 20 bucks or less. In the top 20 column, Mortal Kombat 2 is finally at the top of the charts for the Super Nintendo. And also, Casino Fun Pack has apparently entered the top 20 for the Game Boy. I'm assuming this is strictly due to sales of the game, and less due to people filling out the survey and talking about how pumped they are to play video poker and slot machines on their Game Boy. In the now playing column among the also Rans is Super Bonk, The Incredible Hulk, Frankenstein, and Nickelodeon Guts on the Super Nintendo. Oh, and uh, Michael Jordan Chaos in the Windy City and the Star Trek Generations licensed game on the Game Boy. In Pack Watch, among the upcoming titles, we have Mega Man X2, Kirby's Dream Course, and a licensed game based on the film The Shadow. My pick of the issue is, undoubtedly... Final Fantasy 3, 6, in whatever form you can get it. It is one of the best Final Fantasy games out there in terms of the revisions and modifications of the gameplay mechanics and systems and that sort of thing, along with just the visual style, music, everything. It is really the best Final Fantasy game that was released primarily on a Nintendo system.
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.